Okay, welcome back everyone for the final session of today's Agile 100. Super happy to have Michael Wong uh, join us here today for this uh, fourth and final session. Michael has been a, a longtime management consultant and agilist and also entrepreneur. Um, he has his own company and he's been in this field for a, a bit of over 20 years now. And in 2013, he was so frustrated with how traditional consulting works and he he knew that there was a place for that but based on what he wanted to do it probably was not the right thing so he just went on and built his own company and um, has been leading that company ever since um, you will have your 10-year anniversary in two years michael which is i think really really great and in addition to running his own company and writing a really interesting book which i can highly recommend and he will share more about that uh, in a few moments he is also an alumnus uh, of the Notre Dame University and has been very active as an alumnus. And uh, today, if I'm correct, Michael, you also uh, serve on the university's board of trustees. Is that correct? I, I was, yes. I was. Were, the fun fact were. is, I uh, was the president of the alumni association of my alma mater. There's around 135,000 around the world. And so in that capacity, I was also a trustee of the university for that. Yeah, that which is a lot of work, I assume, uh, next to running your own company. <laughs> so today we have the pleasure of Michael sharing with us his insights that led to the book, Corporate Agility, how agilists can be the catalyst for the transformational change in corporations. Michael, I hand over to you. Really excited to have you with us. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here today. I'm in Washington, D.C. Uh, to speaking with the Agile 100. This is something I've been uh, had on my calendar for several months. And so looking forward to the dialogue. Um, it's Friday afternoon. Uh, let's make, actually make this fun and engaging. So it, the way that I think we should facilitate the next 50 minutes, if it's all right, um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. I think you either are come off mute. I think everyone can actually come off mute. And we can go from there. And if you have a question at the end, that's also great as well. So uh, with that, let's get into it. So um, it's, it's see if I can actually get back on here and next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am and Dave Link and such. And then I'll kind of go into the, the landscape of, of uh, transformations um, that we we see and what we know, at least as, as management consultants here in the US. Um, a little bit about the project and some of the agile lessons, a little more to come on that, and then some final thoughts. So before we kind of get into it, um, um, born and raised in Hawaii in California. I live in Washington, DC today. You can see this photo here. This was actually when I was a trustee. This is a, if you're in the US, you might recognize the Notre Dame, Michigan uh, uh, game. It's a big game in the, in the States here, a football game. Um, and I was honored to be able to give out the flag before uh, that. That's a photo there. I'm also um, a proud father of four. You can see a couple of my kids here. Um, uh, they're involved in competitive Taekwondo and you can see my son in the top right. He actually got uh, two second places in Worlds two years ago, pre-COVID. So we get to do that. That's a lot of fun for us. Um, and then, you know, a little bit about my professional career. After graduating with an accounting degree, I got into management consulting. Um, I was uh, a part of Coopers and Libran. If you, if you remember Coopers and Libran, for those who are much older, um, uh, that was the pre predecessor to PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I, so in that capacity, I got to do a lot of traveling around the world and helping big clients out. Um, but I also started Dave Lake in 2013 because there was an opportunity in the marketplace that I believed in. Uh, I was honored enough to actually not only have uh, a vision, but I had clients and also colleagues that also shared in that vision. And we are here where we are today. Um, in terms of where the offices are, we have a few offices, at least we did prior to, to COVID. We kind of put everyone back and, and everyone went about their way. Um, in terms of um, if you're familiar with the vault rankings in the US, it's kind of a, how we rank management consulting firms. So you see McKinsey, Bain, BCG, Deloitte, Accenture, all on this list. We're actually on the same list. Um, and so we, we, uh, we're much smaller, but it's fun to actually be uh, in the same cohort of these amazing professional service firms. Um, here's some you know, articles and recognitions that we've got along the way. Um, you know, Catherine, in your conversation, you, you talked about uh, in yours about having leaders that 
really want to transform a culture and the lives of people that you get to call colleagues. Um, I was fortunate enough in my first job over Cooper's and Libran to have partners that really cared about me as an individual, right? Life gets in the way of work. I'm traveling all the time. What happens when, and this really happened, I had a, a very personal kind of traumatic thing happen to my immediate family who and how does that get supported at work because it's intertwined and because I had these type of mentors when it was time for me to go start my own shop I pulled on those things in which frankly I was fortunate to have and it's really important to me as the culture as we instill here at Dayblink to be able to pull some of those things along so um, and, and it's not just about billable hours, it's about solving clients. And yes, we have the client focus, but we also have to really understand that people are more than just, you know, widgets within an organization. If you change that way of thinking about it, which is very agile, and you focus on the individual, I think you get a different outcome. So what do we do professionally? We, we do lots of different things, honestly, uh, across our clients. And generally, our clients are Fortune 500, um, you know, uh, uh, type of you know, organizations. These are multinational, huge organizations. Um, they have lots of success, but they also have lots of challenges. And those challenges that, you know, that's when they would call a, a firm like ours to help out with some of those or maybe capture offer some opportunity and, and those are some fun projects we get to help out with. But within the world of Agile, so we do Agile transformation as a service offering specifically, but we also have using agile and other parts of how we do work well you know, on the right hand side you can see here we actually use agile as how we actually do things internally right and so you know even the book i'm about to talk a little bit about some of the insights i had in that journey was created in an agile manner like far be it to actually be an agilist and not write a book in an agile manner so we did um it, we also do you know everything from strategy um, and I was just on a call this morning with a, a, a client. It was a, actually a former client who left um, and, and is in a new spot and is saying, hey, can you actually, what, what you did over there, can you do over here from an agile transformation perspective? So they're starting from scratch. It's really excited to actually have conversations with companies and groups that are starting on their agile journey, which is frankly, you know, sometimes rare because of where we are. It's been propagated in many places. Um, but yeah, starting there, doing assessment. And one of the things actually, uh, when I was having this conversation earlier today, they're like, what do you mean? It's, we might not be ready to do agile. I'm like, but we want to do it. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe not. And there's like, there's some key things we should be thoughtful before you embark on the journey, right? And you get understanding what the goal is, you know, you, hypothetically, if you just bought a company, you know, and you're about to merge them together. Is that the right time to do this? Or, hey, you, you're really going through, you know, missing your targets. Maybe this is the right time to do it. Maybe not. Like, what are you trying to accomplish and understanding that? And is this the time and place to pull this? Because what you don't want, you want to try and minimize false starts, right? And, and transformations. And so being thoughtful about the beginning of that journey is something that we, we like to kind of impress upon. Once we kind of understand whether it's strategy, roadmap, backlog, and we create a backlog for the transformation of all the major things that have to happen. Um, and then we help them, our clients with the implementation and the rollout. So sprint zero all the way through, you know, helping stand up teams and then pull away in terms of coaches where those teams are autonomous and going. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, optimization. Hey, you've been already on your agile journey for years. and Again, you're, there's no destination in my 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 world for for agile transformations because you're just on a journey. You're a different different spot of it, and right? And sometimes it's working. You have the momentum. And it's work and it's great. But sometimes you have to kind of reflect, take a time out, saying, "Hey, what's working? What's not? Is this is this what we thought it was going to be? Is it giving the returns and engagement that we thought? And if not, what should we do differently?" It's very agile to ask that question, right? And so um, we help with the optimization. Um, we have, you know, a bunch of happy clients, we think, uh, and, you know, this is a little bit about the book. So we were just, you know, doing our management consulting, helping big clients out, and, and the folks over at Wiley reached out and said, hey, would you want to write a book? And I said, thanks, but, like, I don't write books. I've never written a book. Like, I'm, I'm a management consultant. I help my clients solve problems. 
And there's so much literature out there on agile and agile transformations and such that I thought, you know what, the last thing I want to do is just add to this collateral out in the marketplace that is frankly not very interesting. It's not really worth my time to go do so. I don't need my name on a book. It's not something that's important to me. But as we had more and more conversations and we did more and more research about the literature out there, as we look at my client set, which is large enterprises, Fortune 500 type of, of organizations, there wasn't a lot, frankly, that we could find objectives, uh, objective views as to what is working and what's not, right? And so we wanted to take on that project, right? So we said, hey, let's go do this and do this right. Um, if we were to go do this, and understand what's working, what's not in the Fortune 500, how will we do it? Well, we reached out literally to every Fortune 500 uh, company and tried to find their agilists and engage them in conversation. We reached out to every signatory of the Agile Manifesto. We actually reached out to the top 10 management consulting firms and their practice leads associated with Agile and Agile transformation. So we really did our best to try to create a wide net because honestly, I know what I know. But there's a lot I don't know. And for us to be able to tap into other experiences, uh, some very well-known individuals within the Agile world, um, for them to honor us with their insights and their time to contribute to this was, was a lot of fun. And so a lot of them, you can find them in the book. Uh, um, some of them are clients, some of them are just industry executives, some are thought leaders. Um, and um, we took what not only what we understood because of the marketplace and what we do for our big clients and what's working and what's not. We put that on the table and we started to kind of iterate over time with the primary research and the secondary research. And at the end, we came up with what the, some of the findings within the book and some of the best practices of, of what's happening. So with, with that, let's try to talk about, you know, where we are. I mean, I don't need to tell people on this call that, you know, the, the, the world is uh, upside down when it comes to business. Um, if, if COVID saw us, and again, imagine this, the timing of this book. We wrote, we took on this project basically a year before COVID. It came out the November right before COVID. And so the ability to be, if, no, actually it came out last year. So it came, we wrote it, we finished it during COVID and it came out in November of this year, or this past year. Um, and so if anything has been you know, taught to all of us that you know, the world is, can change very quickly and your organization should be able to react to that. And if you can react to that dynamic uh, landscape shift, you will do better than your competitors, right? And so that is kind of the lesson. Um, so um, if you think about like what companies are trying to go do and how they're supposed to try to kind of keep up with competition. I mean, change is consistent. Like, I mean, the Fortune 500, when I say, you know, early on, but these are my clients, there is a significant turn of the S&P 500 or Fortune 500 kind of clients all the time. Um, there's new disruptors kind of coming in and there's people getting displaced. And if you don't think about, if you are an executive in a big company and you're just the new CEO appointed to one of these organizations, what do you do to stay on top? How do you differentiate? And because if you don't, your competitors will come in. Those disruptors, those mill tier, those great ideas, those you know, great management teams that are kind of right behind you, real hungry, they will actually be able to outmaneuver you and be able to displace you. So what do you need to go do? And so I think, you know, I don't need to tell people on this call again, like, but like, they're looking for answers and Agile is one of the things in which they know or think about. And that's the conversation of people entertaining going down the path of Agile transformations at scale. So people are doing it, right? And here's some of the data that we've pulled together. And, you know, you know Jeff Sutherland actually, I just saw a post from him uh, was yesterday. He responded to somebody else's post on LinkedIn, um, you know, commenting that, you know, um, Agile transformations don't have a high success rate. We kind of need to go figure that out. Like we should be reflective as to why, why they're not. Um, and if you think about this, this is what we had. I think he referenced a 56% failure rate. I think, you know, our data suggests it's, it's 47, but you know, it's cut in half. 50% of people who embark upon an agile transformation don't get the results of which they're hoping for, right? And so why is that? And that's a big percentage, right? But and I think 
you know, as an agilist, and one of the things in which we kind of instilled at, at Dayblink early on were some of those core agile principles, and that's where we've gotten to where we are. That being said, like if a failure rate of 50% is actually what we're seeing in the marketplace, I think it's important to go, well, what's working, what's not? And I, I don't even know what failure means in agile because agile and failure, it's like, well, you fail and you inspect and adapt and you'll get better over time, right? So like, how, how does it actually fail? I'm not sure, but those are the kind of questions in which you know, we ask through this, this project, right? And so um, understanding this challenge was a, one of the reasons we took on this pretty in, intensive project. And so through that effort of those conversations um, and that research and, and work, we distilled some themes, right? And we call them the agile lessons. When we started this project, we had a hypothesis of these agile lessons. There were 10 of them. Um, and as we interviewed people, we did our research and we did think certain things, we got a lot more insightful. And again, through those sprints, we added and went up to, it was 10, it went up to 12, and then it came back down. We consolidated some, we saw, saw some themes as to why did this transformation fail? It's very similar to these other two. We started distilling those insights and we ultimately culminated on at the end of the book project with, with six. And if we had more time, we probably would evolve even further, right? Because it's, it's, sometimes it's a function of like uh, some, some book deadlines. And so we, we got it done and, and this is what we have. We, we had some fun with the alliteration here of the, of the six different Agile lessons. Um, but you know, hopefully the book, it's a relatively quick read if, you, if you're interested. Um, it it, it kind of talks about some of the insights and how to think about it and some of the perspectives that we have. Um, you may or may not agree with them. I'm curious as to your insights as other agilists kind of feeding back because it's, it's always fun to kind of learn from others. And so to the extent that uh, you have any insights, I'd love to hear from you and, and share any, any thoughts. But what, we, what we've done, if you look at those kind of six different areas, and we're gonna go into some detail here shortly, we, we kind of group these thematic things in which we found, right? And so, you know, it's really important to understand the why of what you're doing. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Like, you know, don't start without an understanding of why. Well, we're doing Agile. Well, why are you doing Agile? Like, tell me more. Like, that sounds great. I'm, I'm excited about that too, like you are. But why, right? And really understand that because once we understand that, then we can set ourselves up for, for success. Because if you, I don't understand that, it's hard to, again, as an outside advisor who kind of helps clients through these, setting those expectations. I mean, I think sometimes people have this kind of perception of agile as this kind of magical thing and it's going to get agile. And then all of a sudden, well, it's magic. Great. Let's go do that. And everyone's happy and we're getting these sprints and we have these standups and we're just getting this velocity and it's going to be great. Maybe. Um, so understanding that is, is a really kind of important first step, right? Agile for me personally, is about people, you know, and Catherine mentioned that in the, in the conversation before that, right? It's really about understanding the people. Because if you understand the people and you really put the people first and you really empower them, a lot of this magic will unfold. And if it's not, if you're just going through the ceremonies and the structure of Agile, it generally no, that doesn't work. And I, I don't need to tell people on, on this call that, right? Um, we have some tactical things in there. We talk about trust. Um, one thing here I want to highlight again, I kind of mentioned it before, like, well, you know, half agile transformations fail, like, what does that actually mean? And we, and we talk about that in, in this second concept of failure is fine. Like you have to create, and if you're going to be successful, you're going to have to create a culture where people are okay with failure individually and organizationally. There should be, there should be some guardrails. There should be some oversight. Um, there should be failure that is, is thoughtful, but most importantly, I think it's important about learning as, a, as an individual and as an organization through those failings. And in, in the book, we talk about, well, there's a, you know, there's, I know there's a lot of people around the world on this, on this conversation. Um, there's a, a large hotel kind of luxury uh, chain um, that's a client of ours uh, called Lug, uh, Leading Hotels of the World. And they have some beautiful properties around the world. 
um, and their chief marketing officer, um, a gentleman named uh, Phil Kozarowski, you know, celebrates failures on his team. Right. And, and they do it every, on a month and they talk about it as a team and they use that as a learning opportunity where they encourage risk. And if you don't take on risk, how are you going to innovate? Right. And so if you're going to be exceptional, you have to be able to take that on and you have to set a tone at the top that it's OK to do that. And that's where when the chief marketing officer is saying it's OK to take on risk and innovate. There's an opportunity to be exceptional, right? But you have to be able to, to also kind of instill that at the individual level. Um, looking at the, it, it, there's a little bit of detail we have on each one of these that are kind of highlighted. Um, getting back to the people again, like it, if you're gonna do a transformation, people are gonna know if it's working or not, and they're gonna know if it's real or not, right? Is there a sense of permanency here or is this just another flavor? Right. And one of the things in which employees will look for is, is, is HR involved? Is this a real job title? You want me to move over? You want me to be this thing called a scrum master? Oh, okay. What is that again? You could train me on it. But like, if I still have my desk over there and I still have my, my boss meeting with me all the time, and I also get paid the exact same and my job title is exactly the same still. People are going to know that, right? And they're going to go, what do you mean you're doing this? We're really doing this? Like, but you're not changing the way in which we are measuring and monitoring and rewarding our employees. So if you are serious about this, I think you need to be able to take on those harder, more permanent type of things within HR. And when you go into PeopleSoft or SAP and you create new job titles, and these are people who new roles are going to be there on a more permanent basis, you're going to set yourself up for a longer term um, path to success. When you're hiring people into those roles, we have job recs that I think, again, this signals to individuals. I mean, you're, you're, if you think about a population of a large comp company, you're gonna have those early adopters. They're really excited about it. Hey, I did this over there. I, I did a past company. This is really exciting. I'm really excited about this. You're gonna have those kind of uh, you know um, um, late adopt early adopters and late adopters. What you're trying to do is try to pull those individuals up and be able to get on board what we're trying to accomplish as quickly as possible. Less um, they might turn into detractors uh, in terms of the transformation, and so being able to pull those individuals further, faster is, is, is always uh, ideal. Nail and scale, this is the ability to, if you think about agile transformations, your big company, don't take on the whole thing at once. I think it's, it sounds common sense, but that's actually not necessarily sometimes what people do. Start small, find something where the, there's kind of a logical place where people who are bought in and, and it's kind of ripe for this kind of type of, of work. So you can actually inspect and adapt in that group, figure it out, tailor it to the organization because the culture is different in every company. It sounds intuitive. If, if Agile is about people and people's cult, cult, uh, is, is makes up a culture, well, how can I take a, a solution that works for one big company and think it's going to be the same at some, some other country. It's, it's, it just doesn't make sense, right? So you need to be able to kind of home grow it and finding a place to start to plant a seed and figure out what works for that organization is, is what we found to actually be uh, much more fruitful in terms of success. Because before you're trying to get it, you know, make it prime time for the broader audience, what you want to be able to do is really kind of create the momentum. And frankly, those change champions from that smaller group as you get bigger and bigger and you train and you innovate, you show those wins associated with those first teams in that one smaller part of the organization. And then you can see other parts of the organization to the extent it makes sense. Um, and then, you know, the last kind of one I wanted to highlight here, again, there's quite a few things in which we kind of cover within this project in this book, um, is adoption, right? One of the things that we do in all of our teams that we kind of help facilitate, we do an NPS, we do an NPS before teams form, we actually show it after it's every sprint, we actually like to be able to understand where their engagement is. And what we found, the, the data suggests, uh, over time, teams 
scores go back to the norm, right? And so you'd be like, wow, that's actually it not working. And then what we found is if you kind of look at product productivity or output of that team, and it's, you gotta be careful about how you measure that, especially as you look across teams, what we found is um, they're, they're pr producing well, right? But they're not as excited about agile, right? And doing agile in an agile manner. We believe that is because it's just human nature. Once you've done it for months, like the novelty of this new way, even though it's exciting and it's fun and invigorating, is not necessarily going to be something that people are going to be excited about. We liken it to if you get a new technology, hey, there's the new Apple phone, right? You got it. You're using it for the first time. There's a lot of functionality. It's very different than what you had before. And you're really engaged and then that pro score is pretty high, but over time, it just turns into a phone for you, right? Until you get the next release and it kind of follows this kind of curve. And so what we've we found is that, and again, the data suggests that um, it's okay to actually have an NPS come down over time. Um, the concern is if it's not high out of the gates, why is it not high out of the gates? Because it should be the way that if it's properly deployed. Um, a couple of things here in terms of detail. Uh, as you look at large organizations, multinational companies, they're generally going to be dispersed around the world. Well, now you're going to have organizations that have people from all over the world, just like this call. How we would work together if we were one team would have to take into account the individuals and the values and backgrounds in which we all have, which is going to be very diverse. So if we're gonna be a team, how do we start pulling that together and account for that in a, uh, one team, let alone a whole organization that is gonna be going through an agile transformation? Um, and so it's, it adds to the complexity as you start thinking about your teams and you, as you start thinking about the different geographies and the cultures. Um, and, and so as the values of a country in, let's just say in China, and how they actually interact socially uh, in terms of a very hierarchical kind of organization uh, is, is just like the, the country is and the respect that is espoused to those of authority has to be taken into account of how you engage them if they're gonna be on uh, a scrum team, right? And how do you pull that, whether it's India, South America, North America, Europe, if you think about those differences, it's a starting point you can be setting yourself up for success as you take that into account as how you would structure this and, and engage. Um, some of the other things that we have, you know, like there's a lot of Scrum Master, Scrum certifications out there. You know, it's, it's you know, if you're gonna be looking for kind of uh, individuals to actually help you, it's really about experience, right? I mean, certifications can actually, depending upon the certification, require experience and such, but sometimes not. And so one of the things we found is some of these larger transformations, the mistake has been made where you're not getting the right people in the right roles to help with those, especially the in-house ones, not necessarily external. Um, it's really important to get those experiences, uh, the right people in those roles to drive them, right? Not rely upon just credentials of certifications. Um, we also kind of highlight it's, it's important, you know, it's kind of odd maybe from an outsider who's a management consultant to say, hey, don't rely upon consultants, but it's really important. Again, if you think about where some of these large transformations go sideways, they just try to outsource the whole thing to these big companies like PwC and IBM and Accenture. They go, hey, go, go, just go run this thing for us. But really the problem is it gets too expensive over time. The CFO is gonna go, wait a second, why are we spending so much money on this, right? And you're gonna get, it's, it makes sense because the early wins just make complete sense. The business case is there, but over time as it becomes institutionalized, the value of them kind of is not as, as pronounced. And what happens is if you have outsiders driving your transformation and they go away or they get pulled back, it just kind of crumbles and the momentum is lost because they were really relying upon outsiders. So you, as an outsider myself, if you really want to influence long-term effective change, you need to instill it early in the organization, right? And you, so it, it can take root 
organically. And I think that's an important thing that we also found. Um, we talked a little bit about the nail and scale, right? Start small, find a place that's ripe to actually go ahead and take root, fertile ground, get it, get it figured out for that organization, change it over time, make it tailored to their organization that then can propagate out. Again, it sounds intuitive, but sometimes people want to go fast. In fact, there's some people that, you know, some clients are like, this is great. We're going to go do this. And, you know, we're going to have 50 scrum teams by the end of the year. I'm like, we, 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 that's not a goal. Like, let's, let's take a step back and like understand like what we're actually trying to accomplish so that we can set baselines and we show value. If I can do that, we're going to have a, we'll be on a path for long-term success. I mentioned this before, again, this is some of the data that we have net promoter scores, you can see, you know, if you know, net promoter scores zero to 100 positive and, and zero to negative 100 is kind of how you score NPS. Um, and so you can see here, this is normalization of lots of different data that we were able to achieve by sprint, assume a two week sprint, uh, you can see they're, they're generally not as happy working in the old way we come up with this new way of working. You see it pop almost immediately, right? This is great, right? And to have a, if you know MPS scores, I mean, to be in the 50s is really good, right? And so you say, okay, people are really excited about working in this way. But as you can see, you know, let's just talk about three months, six months into it, you start seeing it basically pull back, right? And again, that's just, I think that our, our, our hypothesis and what we put in, into the book is frankly, this is, just now who you are as an organization and how you work, right? And so it only makes sense that that comes back, right? So um, I think that kind of, you know, just there's a lot of stuff in here. And so hopefully this has, you know, been somewhat uh, helpful or interesting uh, on a Friday afternoon. Um, any, uh, so in terms of final thoughts, one of the things I, I can just, you know, ask, uh, we, we have, conversations with lots of folks uh, about helping them in their transformations. If you are a coach, if you actually are interested in, in uh, potentially collaborating on some of these, you know, we, we're creating a little bit of a, a database behind the scenes of people that we can tap into because, you know, sometimes it, it like I said earlier, it takes people who have experience, right? Um, and I, I would say that the Agile 100 attracts the right type of individual who actually has experience and interest in these topical areas. And so to the extent that you uh, have an interest, please reach out to, via LinkedIn. Love to hear from you and connect with you. And if there's a, uh, an opportunity to collaborate, if you have some insights on some of the things I talked about today or in the book, love to hear from you. Uh, we do have a website. It has some of the collateral up there. Uh, we have some white papers posted. We have kind of a, a small little community that we've created. Uh, and then we also have the, the book. So with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining, um, and then I'll just open it up for any questions if there's if there's any out there. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I definitely have questions, and uh, I'll just start, and then other people I think can can chime in as well. So, um, what I really liked early on was asking the question whether a company is even ready for embarking on that journey. And when you were talking about this. I immediately did a, did a small drawing here of the Kilimanjaro because my wife and I were, pre were preparing to go there next year. And um, you need to get some coaching in terms of, okay, what, what do you have to do? How do you build up like the strength? And then even if you have that coaching, once you go on that tour, you have someone like a Sherpa in, in, in Tanzania, it's not called Sherpa, but you have a guide that guides you. So you have both of those things. And I really like that because I've never, I mean, I've never thought about this. Like, what is it, what does it take to be ready to even embark on the journey, right? I, I was always aware there is a journey and that journey is long. It's not like 12 months, two years, whatever. Mm -hmm. But like the readiness for that journey in itself is, is a different step. And what would be the things for you that you believe are necessary, that needs to be in place in order for a, client for an organization to be really ready to embark on that journey. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think two things are kind of critical, right? The first thing is organizationally, you know what you want to do, 
Like, what is your problem? What do you need to go do as an organization? You have to have clarity as to that strategy and that plan. Because agile for me, again, is just a way of doing work and engaging people in a more humane way to get better output. I mean, that's ultimately what it is, right? But just because it makes sense, especially in Silicon, if you could go back to the history of the manifesto and the successes in Silicon Valley and small teams and technology, just because it worked there exceptionally well, right? And, and doesn't necessarily gonna mean it's gonna take root in a you know, 27,000 you know, employee company that's around the world, right? Uh, doing non-technology things, right? I, I think you really have to understand what is important to that organization first, right? And sometimes you, people think they know, but until you ask the question, you keep asking and you do their five whys and you're trying to understand really what's going on. Um, it's not super clear. The second thing is the people, right? And if you believe that Agile is really about unlocking the potential of the individual, like I do, if the organization's going through a lot of disruption, my coaching is, and I just, again, I just had this conversation with somebody, um, do you wait until there's stability and go, there's a lot of turmoil and things that they have to happen to get them to the next level. And so let's go wait for that. Or do you take it on now and use Agile to then help enable the next chapter of their organization? Both are great answers or awful answers. It really depends, right? And so I can tease that out and go, hey, you don't have any product owners. You don't have any servant leaders. You should probably go not do this right now because you're just not, you're not going to have the talent that I can then develop to be into these roles because of what I'm starting with. So don't, don't do it. Go hire that type of helper. That's maybe one answer. The other answer is let's go create that right now. Give an opportunity to those individuals to rise to the opportunity, try to coach them up. And if they make it great, and if they don't, we're going to hire people to actually step in those roles that are, that's also an okay answer too. Um, and so really understanding, you know, what we're trying to solve and make sure that that's clear and also the human aspect of it is really the ingredients for are you ready it's not the tools it's not the reporting it's not any of those other type of kind of tactical things it's really about the raw ingredients of long-term success transformations whether it's a technical transformation whether it's a human-based transformation like an agile transformation you really need to avoid false starts because as soon as an organization parks upon something and it doesn't work, you already set yourself up for, and then we try it again, you're going to have more detractors and naysayers and people are going to wait for things to happen. And you're going to be that laggard of, of adoption, right? So you really want to minimize those false starts. False starts, yeah. Uh, the, the other concept that I, that I liked, and this is something I've used myself, but just using different terminology was the nail and scale. Now, when you think about product development, I mean, that's like one of the key elements of agility. You first try to get problem solution fit. Then you try to get product market fit. And then you try to get like business model fit, right? Now, when we think about organizations, an organization can ultimately also be considered as a product, right? So if you try to do the whole transformation right off the start, it's probably like trying to like get the business model right, right away without getting all the other steps in between. So do you have some examples, um, and you don't have to name the clients, of course, where, where they didn't do the nail and scale well, and some others where the nail and scale worked exceptionally well, and in what kind of areas they did the initial nailing? Like were it like individual teams working on certain products and how did they select those teams and the projects or products or whatever, like share, share some experiences around that, please. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's start with the, I always like to start with the fun, successful ones first. Let's do that before we talk about ones that didn't go so well. Um, so uh, one of our clients um, had a specific um need financially they needed to go drive business you know, drive 
costs out of the organization, right? So how do you do that? They had some hypotheses of how to go do it, but they didn't know how to go do it. So they know kind of ideas, but then the mechanics of it was still up in the air. Agile was used to help prioritize cost-saving opportunities that not only resulted in cost savings, but also better customer outcomes. So imagine you're saving money organizationally, but also making your customers happier, right? So there was this whole backlog of things people kind of knew about. There was, yeah, we should go do this, but like, it's not my job, it's not your job. So this was a cross-functional part of the organization that was kind of pulled, all these ideas are pulled together into this one group. This one group was working in an agile manner to prioritize, first of all, building out where those different opportunities were and then driving them and driving them and driving them and driving them. And it was a couple things. Now you're cross-functionally working together more than you've done before and you're showing better business outcomes and higher customer satisfaction, nothing better to start with that because then you can get like, it's easy to get the CFO on board. It's really, really easy to get the chief marketing officer on board, the customer satisfaction sports are just kind of speak for themselves. And then you can get going, right? And so this was uh, not like, hey, skunk, skunks were kind of like this other group and some other geography doing something that nobody knows about. It was done in a manner that was thoughtful because the teams that were pulled to kind of help cross-functionally were effectively hand-selected. Um, and so there were the right talented individuals and uh, allowed for um, that success. And, and again, like we talk about, you want to have the momentum. So, wow, this is great, a new, a new way and they're getting points on the board. That's great. So fast forward to, um, I guess the, the one in which you kind of go broader. I think this is where, you know, agile goes astray, right? Where you don't understand the why you're trying to um, do what you're doing, right? And you probably seen this. I mean, I, I don't need to tell, tell everyone, but this is um, the ability to say, hey, my goal for this year is to have so many story points, so many scrum teams, right? That's literally a goal. Like, like, I'm like, well, how is that a goal, right? I mean, like, really? Like, okay, we can accomplish that goal pretty quickly. But again, this is where the you lose sight of the why. That's why it's really important to start the the front. So if you just had say, like, I literally, this was the goal: fifty scrum teams. Well, boom, overnight we can we can get the training room reserved. We can get the trainers there. We can go get you know uh, sauna or or Jira. All the boards are ready to go. We'll have our standups over here and you have your 50, boom, overnight, effectively. And um, I think it's important to understand that like that doesn't bode well for outcomes. Um, and so, you know, um, focusing on just the, the, the outcomes will then kind of come back to the KPIs and therefore what we're trying to do. And so um, again, big, and I've seen this in outside of Agile too. Sometimes people just want to move on and get, get on and I get it, right? But there are some consequences of the big bang approach on, on anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Michael. Oleg, you have raised your hand. Feel free to unmute and share your question. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> when I was listening to you, uh, I had a feeling, and I would just like to confirm the feeling that basically to transform the corporation, you have to get a little bit violent and i like when you for example saying i am, am i reporting to the same boss am i sitting in the same place so what you i i hear is well you won't work with the same boss that your team will be totally different team because your role is different sorry go here is your new team <laughs> yeah well yeah I think that's part of it, right? I mean, ultimately, if you're doing an agile transformation, I mean, and we talk about this and I think scaled uh, agile talks, uh, not so much in some of the methodologies that I've seen, but we've, we talk about a little bit in the book because it's something I have to deal with with my clients is like, wait a second, all my team, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a senior manager. The people that used to report to me are now being pulled off under these scrum teams. 
but I'm not allowed to actually go influence them because I have the scrum master that says, go back off. My team's got to get work done. And so you're like, well, what's my job now, right? What is the role of middle management in a successfully transformed agile company? And if you look at companies like Amazon, there's not a lot of middle managers. They basically have created people at the edge doing the work, empowered to do the work, pay them more, and and trust them to go do it. And the, the oversight is much thinner, right? And so that that that's I don't need to kind of posit that Amazon's pretty successful. I, I think that is kind of the evolving model. It's really hard though, if you're that middle manager saying, okay, well, I was just, I, I've been here for 15 years. Now I kind of got promoted to this. Like now these people don't report to me. Like, what is your role? There is a role. There is a, is a it's, it's a more human role of actually kind of coaching and mentoring those individuals that are no longer doing your kind of work in a direct line because they're independent on a team and empowered to go do that and protected by their scrum master to go do so. So there is a conversation and role for them. I mean, is it possible? You know, we've seen, you know, successful, you know, lower middle managers turn into POs and that makes sense. And you can actually kind of, you know, if you go look at the scale, at scrum at scale, there's, you know, roles for these individuals, depending upon the organization, what you're doing for people to have, have homes. But um, that, that's definitely a, something that has to be tackled. Yeah. But cause you have to, I mean, if, if I'm sitting in the same spot doing the exact same thing, but I, now I'm just a part of a team, like what, is, what is that? I mean, I, again, getting back to the goal of the transformation, am I getting a different business outcome? If I'm not getting a business outcome, that's any different. What are we doing here? Well, I, but this, what you said provokes me the second question, because if I look into my organization, on my part of organization, I observe, I see that two kinds of people anchor the organization in current culture and prevents this culture to move forward. Mm -hmm. And this is line management, which is super strong. And well, we are doing this for 15 years, like, like you said, what's up with, oh, we could want to do Scrum, do Scrum, but listen to me. This is one issue. And uh, second issue is how people like project people, like project managers, etc. They also, they're not building teams that give in orders, micromanage, etc. Instead of, okay, stop, give responsibility to people who actually have this responsibility. Uh, so, and what you are saying, if you redistribute them as PO, uh, is there a change? Really, is, is there a change? If they still behave like they behaved for 15 years? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the complexity of moving to agile is one of the things you're just highlighting, but imagine that's now done across a large 10,000, 50,000, hundred thousand organization, right? I mean, there's institutional knowledge and people who have been there for a long time and know how it works. That's, that's great. But it's also a challenge, right? So we're asking people to fundamentally at the individual level, transform how they see the world and operate in the world. Some will be those early adopters, yes, but there's some are gonna be those detractors. And we talk about the different types. Some detractors you can actually pull along and they can come back and be a part of the organization and the transformation. Some you're gonna to have to get rid of because they're never gonna get there. Remember I talked about the very beginning, like it has to be, um, uh, if you're people centric and you know what you're trying to do, the, the tone at the top really matters. Gotta to understand who the people are gonna look up to for that. Usually it's going to be the CEO, maybe it's a division president, somebody else, but that individual in the, from, from there down will cascade, if, is it real or not? One of the things I'm hearing from you is it, there's buy-in to the process, but it's also, I got to do this. It's, yeah, I got to do this, but like, that's not a transformation. That's a hobby. Like, that's not, I mean, ultimately, uh, how can you really unlock the power of what we're talking about here by just giving you more work and a different you know framework to operate. Now I have to op 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 operate in two worlds. Like that's even worse. Like I don't want to do that. Um, and people know. People know when you haven't you know burned those boats, right? <laughs> is, this, is this real or not? And they're gonna wait. They're gonna wait for those indicators that this is actually real within the organization. Thanks. Yeah, of course.
Thank you, Oleg, for the question. I don't know who was first, but I'll go with the Dennis and then Ingrid, as Ingrid has already asked the question in today's session. So Dennis, you go. Hi, Michael. Legends. I would like to um, ask a bit about your experience with different corporations. If we talk about corporate agility, that at least to me is composed of very different things on different levels. It's personal agility, team agility, scaled agility, organizational agility, and business agility, fine. Um, what I'm asking is, in your experience, the corporations that you work with, where was really the bottleneck and the need for agility? Was it rather on a portfolio level, organizational, business level, or rather on a team level? So are you talking about like where, if they when they started to adopt agile practices, what was the challenge? And that's why, why did they ad adopt it then? Or I was uh, trying to ask about the true challenge. Um, in my experience, if I talk to, to um, the corporations in my domain, uh, the question that they're posing is, how can we get scrum teams? How can we get release trains? So they're talking about team level, maybe scale yep. level. Yep. But if you dig deeper, most of the corporations that I know really have a problem at the portfolio or at the business level and not so much at the team level. And that's what I try to compare. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, great question. Thank you, Dennis. So depends on the group, right? So if, from a technology perspective, I would agree with you. I think, I think that's not a team level issue and they've already kind of figured that out. I think, you know, the person kind of the team level, that's, I think over the last 10 years, we've figured that there's a lot of kind of practice and, and, and performance there that I would say outside of technology, there's still a lot of untapped opportunity in at the at the team and individual level right and i i i think if if i just think of agile just broader agile we will be in a better spot as agilists if we can really continue to propagate agile outside of technology right just 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 we got to do it and if we do that the silo because what you've created is this dichotomy in these large organizations of technologists and everybody else right and there's a natural kind of friction already before we even did this, but if we can actually get those non-technologists to understand the power of what we're doing on the technology side, I think as an organization, you're going to have a better foundation to build upon. And if you do that, then we have the power to bring it up to a kind of a, a business agility, right? That allows for you to go and do some really powerful things. But I think in a lot of organizations, there is a natural friction between that and there is an opportunity to kind of capture a lot of quick wins on the business side. And then we can actually normalize it. That, that's, that's my hope is, you know, if we think about where Agile is going to be in the next five, 10 years, we'll continue to get some wins over there. Ooh. And Ingrid, final question as we're heading the end of our time locks. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Hello, Michael. Hello. So my question will be maybe a little bit different. Uh, let's imagine the scenario that you are working in agile environment and some customer reached to you that he wants you to develop some product for him. But that customer doesn't know what agile means. He has no experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, in agile, you know that you need like a regular uh, cooperation with the customer during development to have regular feedback. But the customer will tell you that well, we have this dedicated person that will be in contact with you. Uh, you can reach him twice a week, yeah, or, or once in two weeks, let's, it depends. And this information will go through that assistant, another assistant, another assistant to that particular person, yeah? So we don't have these uh, touch points regularly. And now my question is, uh, is then, if you would go to the cooperation with such a customer, is then your responsibility as Agile team to teach that customer what Agile means? Um, well, uh, if you're going to want to unlock the power of the Agile team and getting that customer feedback in a timely manner, I think, yeah, you have to, unfortunately, if you can. I mean, ultimately, the, the constraints you're kind of being kind of given is... Um, 
not uncommon, unfortunately, but that's the whole point of if you can change the dynamic of how work is getting done and you get that regular customer feedback in a timely manner so the team can continue to iterate and actually get to that better kind of outcome, they're going to be better served. But if they're not an engaged customer or they're not providing the right timely feedback, it's not fair to that team to assume you're going to get there um, with in the right timing or with the right output, right? And that's just a constraint that you have. There's other things you can potentially entertain, which is maybe what you do is if there's this customer, maybe there's other stakeholders that you can get feedback from and triangulate to help inform that backlog and, and, and hopefully get to a better outcome. If, if, especially if there's lots of intermediaries between you and that customer, that's always a, a bit of a challenge, right? You really want to ideally break those down, they can come out and come back and actually see at the end of that sprint, all the hard work of the team, give that feedback, give that praise, and then, you know, create that next, you know, backlog. So, so Ingrid, I, I, I don't envy you that, that situation. Um, I, I, it's not, not an easy one. So uh, it's but not think, a real situation for me. Sorry. I'm just curious because I heard about things happening like this. Yeah, well, again, like there's, I mean, there's, we're asking people to do a lot, right? We're asking people to fundamentally the way, change the way in which they do work, right? And it's not easy. And so um, sometimes it's just going to try a little bit and still do everything the same. Sometimes it's like, well, I'm just going to do everything the same. You're at, like, you're agile. That's fine. Just give me my, what I need. Well, part of the process of actually getting me a better outcome is actually having a different way to engage the customer. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer. Of course, thank, thank you for you. the question. Michael, thank you so much. I want to be conscious of your time, conscious of everybody else's time. It was a pleasure hosting you. Thank you again for making the time and being here and uh, wish you all the best. Um, everyone read the book, Corporate Agility by Michael Wong. There are a ton of good stories in there. And this is the end of today's session.